good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, it is another cold, chilly day in Terrace, BC. Um, thank you for joining us for our second winter wellness uh, series today. Before we start, I just want to acknowledge that we're on Simchen territory here, and we um, appreciate um, their kindness and allowing us to live here and raise our families and do all those things on their territory. And we have some Niska people here, people who live in the Ness, and Megan, you're from another area. <laughs> you fill that blend the blanks there. So my name is Mary Cotton-Mitchell-Val. I've organized this event today. Um, Megan and I have been brewing on this since July when we originally met, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. I want to <coughs> welcome Morris Watt, Megan Olson, and Renee Mormon today. So I'm just going to let you guys take it away. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. So welcome, everyone. It's really nice to see you all. And welcome whoever's on the line, on the television, or the computer. <laughs> um, so who was here last week? Can I just see a show of hands? Almost everyone? Good. So last week we kind of did like a beginner kind of introduction into uh, medicine making and herbalism. Um, <coughs> Harvesting, wildcrafting, some of those things. And then we covered a few plants. So I think we did pine sap, right? And we did, um, I don't even remember. Does anyone Pearly else remember? Everlasting. Right, Pearly Everlasting, one of my favorites. And cottonwood bud. Good, you guys are paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that we didn't get an. Um, uh, a real uh, lengthy few minutes on the pine sap, so we may just touch on it again because I think people had a few questions. <coughs> but first, I always like to open as well with a thank you, and I always like to thank my co facilitators, Morris Watts, for his company and support and all your amazing knowledge that you share with us, and that he helps uh, record the work we do. And then I always want to thank Renee Marvin for going on this crazy journey with me, doing all these workshops and making medicine with me and all those people that we treat. Okay. And um, so, um, Basically, we kind of are a collective now called Nass Valley Wild Medicine, right? I told you guys a little bit about that last week. And we do a lot of workshops and we see people in person to make uh, personal remedies for them using wild plants and traditional medicines. And we work on a, on a principle of accessibility. So we don't throw people away if they don't have money. We take exchanges for the work we do. So we take money, we take trade, or we take uh, barter. And um, most of our donations go back into our, <coughs> well, they, they all go back into our costs. So they go back into um, the costs for our medicine making and for our jars and for packaging and for fuel, things like that. Because uh, right now, there's probably about five of us who are asked who are kind of the active wild crafters in our group. So the other two women that I always like to acknowledge is Wanda and Karen, who we haven't met yet, but you will. And they actively wild craft and make medicines with us. So <clears throat> So maybe we'll just um, touch. Maybe we'll just touch again on pine sap, and we're going to pass it around. Just spend. Uh, we won't spend a lengthy amount of time because we did cover it last week a little bit. But Morris had some really uh, interesting things to say about it, and I know it kind of spurred some conversations after the class. 
So I don't know if anyone had any burning questions about it that they wanted us to answer today. No? Okay. Yeah. Can you review the trees that were the most potent for the sale? Yeah. Or like the spruce tree and the hemlock. Sometimes I hear about tap pine too, but I haven't really gone there. You want to remind how to pick it? Uh, the best way to pick it is not to clean it right off the tree there. You leave some behind, so... Well, it's got a scar on it, so most of the sap comes out of those places. Pine sap, I mean, I always say pine sap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the sap is pretty good for extracting poison off your infected areas, whether you get cut or something like that. So last week we added it to our chest rub that we made with the cottonwood bud. And we make this remedy specific for, and it's super effective. We, we have a hard time keeping it in stock. It seems to really um, relieve pain from coughing. And it opens your airways because you breathe in the smell of the pine sap, the essential oils, or whatever sap you're using, and with the cottonwood. And when you do that, when you breathe in the constituents of both those plants, it helps clean up any virus that's living in your lungs or in the back of your throat. Opens your airways. And it actually is kind of like an antispasmodic. So it relieves pain. It relaxes all those muscles in between our ribs. And the smooth muscle, the mucosa in the back of our throat. So, um, so during those times of the year where we have a cough that lingers and goes on and on and on, where we have a cup of from pneumonia and we have quite a bit of pain from coughing, um, this is when we specifically use it. So remember we talked about the role of sap in the forest, right? So we have these our beautiful stands of trees. They all make, they often make a type of sap or they'll make an essential oil. But at different times of the year, based on their maturity, they'll release into the forest. And that's their protection, right? That's why healthy stands of forest um, can resist things like fungus and bacteria and pests and things that are attacking it, right? Or root rot, whatever it is. And so we always harvest respectfully, knowing that. So we always <coughs> leave some behind because it's like a giant scab on a tree. It's tapping, right? And we. Um, and then we can apply the principle of that, of the action of that sap to us, to, uh, to improving our health. So where we come, sometimes I don't, I forget to mention this piece, but um, with Renee's practice, my practice, and Morris's practice, and when we work together, we're always talking from a place of experience, like practice. Like this is, this is a plant we've actually used on ourselves or with other people, and then this is what we've seen it do, and then what people have told us so just so you guys are knowing like how maybe we know some of this, right? And it's also knowledge that's been given to us, transferred down, and then we've gone out and tried it, right? Yeah. I've used it on uh, my daughter Haley. She gets um, frequent pneumonia and <coughs> chest infection. So it works really well on kids. Mm -hmm. um, so I've used, I just rubbed it on her chest, um, her back, um, and it, it, I believe it really did help um, clear up <coughs> the infection a lot sooner, um, as opposed to when I didn't use it. And um, it, the cottonwood bud works really well for her skin as well, so it kind of works as a double uh, medicine as well. Yeah. That, yes? Have you ever, ever observed any kind of skin reactions to that? No, it's a good question though, because lots of people are allergic to the cottonwood pollen, but it seems to stay there. And then I we have not yet encountered a reaction to cottonwood bud oil, right? Um, so, yeah, and people often are using it who are, they'll often tell us, oh, I'm really highly allergic to the pollen, it's going to affect me, and then they try it and they're fine. So, not yet.
so many levels they're trying to bring balance to your body. They're not an isolated compound that just does one thing like many of our pharmaceuticals. And with that we get less side effects. That's the principle with using whole plants is that <coughs> often at the same time they're balancing your stomach and cleaning your liver and opening your airways so that so a number of things are happening, not just one um, not just one action like uh, for example, like a, like, a, like a Tylenol or something, you know, it's just specifically looking at reducing some levels of pain, right, or reducing some levels of inflammation, working on some prostaglandins. Both the <coughs> pine sap and the uh, cottonwood bud, if you put it on the stove, it can also help yeah. clear the air. So if you, you know, a lot of people are getting sick and whatnot, so in your homes you can use that, put um, the cottonwood bud in um, water and put it on the stove, mm -hmm. and then the pine sap you can melt on the stove, but with both of them you would have to designate a pot because it's going to ruin <laughs> the pot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It'll be what it's for. <laughs> That'll be it. Yes, that, that's what you mentioned last week too, and I know that you kind of ran out of time saying mm -hmm. it, right, with the branch. Mm -hmm. So on your wood stove, Morris was telling us you could just put the branch of the cottonwood on oh. you and then it, mm -hmm. it um, clears your air for you. How much would you <coughs> use? How much do you use, Morris? For on the stove? Yeah. Yeah. It just put a, about three at a time because it gets pretty strong after it. Anywhere from one to three. Three put any more on the end and kind of <coughs> overdoes the air a little too heavy. And it's the resin that you're smelling, right? Yeah. yeah. That sticky red stuff inside, it gets mm -hmm. soft and. Um, yeah, you don't usually need that much when you put it on wood stove. Mm -hmm. I guess you can put it on an electric stove. And you Get a container. Yeah. Not that I'm. Yeah, boil it up. So you're boiling the branches in water. So, okay. Yeah, or the buds. Or you the can, buds. you know, you can do the whole branch, and as long as there's some buds on there too. Oh, okay. Yeah, because <coughs> the resin definitely lives in the buds. There's higher amounts of it, but it's also underneath that bark. Yeah. Um, so I thought we should probably, so last week we kind of talked about how to help um, reduce inflammation in the body, like mucous membranes, how to relieve some of our, soothe some of our symptoms. This week we'll talk a little bit more about like specific antivirals, kind of like killing infection, killing viruses, stopping them from replicating, things like that, as part of a winter wellness. And we kind of we kind of talked about how plants have a really specific role sometimes for us. Um, they're a gift. It's like they'll often strengthen our immunity, so we get over things faster. They'll often soothe us, so they'll um, decrease our symptoms and bring us comfort. And then. Um, <coughs> <laughs> but I know there is a third thing, so when I remember, I'll tell you. <laughs> Let's help you to get over. Your yeah. Infection. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. It helps us be in our recovery. So, um, I think we should do yarrow. Yeah. So we'll start passing that one around. Yarrow is pretty familiar plant with you guys, I'm sure. 
we call heavy, I know it, it grows in abundance around here. So we usually pick it um, starting in the springtime if there's little like, green leaves that come up. And it, um, as it grows through the summer, it goes into flowers, so it's white, purple, or purple. Yeah. Um, it's a really good um, medicine to use because it, it helps you to um, sweat out infection. So usually when I start to um, get a cold or my kids start to get a cold, I'll usually make them tea with it. So I, you can use it fresh or you can use it dried. Um, you can um, usually use about one teaspoon per one cup of boiled water for tea. Um, I actually, for myself, I like to, to drink it in my tea every day just because I like the fragrance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a fever is a really um, life-saving action, right? When we increase our core temperature, it makes it super hard for bugs to live, viruses and bacteria, right? So um, that's the way that yarrow stimulates our um, circulation, right? It increases our heart rate. It opens all of our arteries and veins, so we vasodilate. <coughs> so we have tons more blood running through our body in a faster fashion. And when that does, our immune system cells can move around in a quicker way and kill infection or kill viruses that are starting to take a hold of us. They can clean up mucous membranes that are getting boggy and inflamed <coughs> and sore. And they, um, they go around and they scoop up all the dead cells and they get it to our kidneys and our livers faster. And so when we increase our body temperature with yarrow, things have a harder time living and our immune system works better. And the classic way that you do it, or that you were taught or I was taught, was you take your, like Renee said, your teaspoon to your one cup of hot water. And you're sometimes you're going to drink it almost every um, couple hours for the first stage of that infection where you're feverish, you're getting, you know, it's really coming on, your, your mucous membranes are getting really runny and you feel your bones are aching. Or the other way is you can kind of drink it at night. You can bundle yourself up and you can put yourself to bed and you'll sweat overnight, right, while you're sleeping or if you're home all day sick. And usually within 12 hours, you feel quite a bit better, right, depending on the virus's strength. So the way I think about fevers is sometimes I encourage them for the first 24 hours, right? And then after that, I manage them. So after that, I help them not get out of control. I try to break them. And yarrow will also break a fever. So that's what it's doing as well. So there's some constituents in yarrow that you guys might be familiar with, but they're actually kind of similar to eucalyptus, right? So there's one called cineol, or <coughs> I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but um, <coughs> it's a type of constituent in the plant. And so those are some of the act why it's the actions behind the oils in the plants. There's camphor. I don't know if you guys heard of camphor. It used to be part of many of our old medicines, right? And our vapor rub and stuff like that. So um, it seems to work the best with acute fevers. So like ones that just come on super fast and they're raging for kids and for um, adults. And what it does in the lungs is it also tends to break up phlegm. So when you have a fever with a lung congestion, when you gargle with it, you decrease, you can decrease the swelling in the back of your throat, right? And your tonsils. It's also gonna go in there and clean up any kind of infection that's starting to take hold on your tonsils. That's why we get the viral sore throats. Um, it has a very strong antimicrobial action, this plant, and antiviral. So, um, 
for your liver, it actually tells your liver to make a little bit more bile, so it improves your digestion. It helps you break down fat, because that's what the role of bile is. It increases your urine flow, so you're kind of like peeing out toxins in a more efficient way, or broken down cells, you don't need any more waste anyways. So it promotes kind of the function of your kidneys, which is super important when you're sick. Your kidneys need to share your workload. Sometimes it's all your lungs will work super hard, but your kidneys also have to kind of step up a bit. So, um, in the stomach, Euro's really good at um, tightening things up, basically. So we talk kind of about the role of her, sometimes they have an astringent nature. So it wants to tighten up any mucous membranes and kind of decrease inflammation. So when that happens, you have less bloating, you have less gas, and often this is one I'll use for people who have kind of reoccurring uh, stomach ulcers that are slow to heal, okay? So they need a little bit of extra help just healing, healing them because they're always there, they haven't made a full recovery from them. And because it's improving your circulation, it actually helps to decrease pain and inflammation in your joints and in your uh, muscles. So often we, that's where we can build up some of our free radicals or broken down waste materials from our cells or from having an infection. And so the Yarrow wants to stimulate your circulation. It tells your lymph to move, helps stimulate it, it helps part of your circulation, and it cleans out your joints. And then you pee it out and you have less swelling and less pain. So often I typically use it at the time of when people are sick and they're having a lot of aches and pains that are worse, especially in this weather. So for kids, I use this one a lot because I can't, you know, there's, I'm cautious with using medications with kids. I'm cautious with plants too, but yarrow is one that you can kind of rely on. So often I do one teaspoon of yarrow to one teaspoon of something like fennel or anise seed. And I get them to drink that when they're sick or when they're really sick and it pushes their fever. It pushes them to warm up a bit, and they, um, they sweat it out, they have less pain, they have less swelling in the back of their throat. Um, the only time I don't give large doses to any adult is if they're pregnant. Um, and I mean large, large doses, I mean like, you know, getting them to drink <coughs> three to five cups. A little goes a long way, but large cups, be, large cups of your OT when you're pregnant, because it's a bitter, it can stimulate contraction. So it wants to stimulate the uterus a little bit too much. I've never seen somebody go into preterm labor from drinking yarrow, but I know that enough about the plant that I would take, I would be cautious with it, right? So it wants to, um, it wants to tighten up smooth muscle, right? So it can be kind of stimulating some types of muscle. What else do we do with the other one? If I could add, I use it for a urinary yeah. tract infection. Exactly. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. It's better than cranberry and yeah. it doesn't have the sugar and mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the other negatives of using juice. Yeah, exactly. So yarrow it's super good and super um, effective for urinary tract infections because it's antimicrobial, so when you actually do pee out some of it, it wants to clean up any E. coli that's in your bladder. Plus, it tightens up the bladder, right? So it's tightening up the tissue, making it less inflamed, right? Mm -hmm. um, you were discussing uh, ulcers in the stomach that is good for that, so I assume it would be beneficial for leaky gut as well? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, it's all, leaky gut's all, it's all connected, right? It's kind of the, the tissues are boggy and weak, right? Yeah, for sure. So in the bladder, um, yeah, so specifically for urinary tract infections, plus it increases your core temperature, and um, it's also called a styptic yarrow, so that means it wants to slow down bleeding. 
up toward the 42 week mark and they were using the induction word oh uh, yeah would that be would that be an in a time when you might oh, suggest yeah. Jero to bring labor on yeah. yeah yeah and there's more effective herbs I would I would suggest but yeah that's when you would move towards a bitter right or you would move towards something that's stimulating yeah for sure and that's how midwives used to work right if people were getting past their due date they would when they work closer with herbs, they would often recommend a tonic, right? So often, um, <coughs> typically the fever tea that we make is about one to two te teaspoons to one cup of boiled water. It combines really nice with mint, and mint has its own antimicrobial properties, right? It also soothes the stomach. So. Yarrow is great for the stomach, but at the same time, it can sometimes be a little bit too bitter for people and cause a, like a tummy ache in large doses. So why not just smooth it out right away and avoid that side effect by adding mint always with your yarrow? Or a similar plant that you like the taste of. Maybe it's a niece or fennel. One of those um, kind of plants that we called, I think, a carminative last week, where we said they bring warmth to your gut. Okay, That's what combines well so you can drink it three times a day you can drink it hourly when you have a urinary tract infection you can drink it hourly when you're in the midst of a huge like a big fever and you just feel like you can't even get out of bed you just have that type of influenza your bones are breaking right that pain that comes with it things like that um, often with urinary tract infections it's like I have the person or I'm drinking it like every because the more you increase your urine flow and pee it through, the quicker you're going to be over that infection. So for um, urinary tract infection, you use it in combination with flavor and... Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, you can have it on its own or combined with, like, <coughs> like Renee said, with a plant, a couple plants we haven't done yet, cleaver, So um, for people who have a lot of pain, and the winter can bring that on in a, in a um, stronger way, right? The cold and the damp sometimes. Um, I use Yarrow a lot to decrease inflammation in the joints. People who live with rheumatoid arthritis or different types of pain conditions. Even the autoimmune joint pain. So that's like the type where people maybe have a, um, the plaque psoriasis or some kind of psoriasis. And then for some people, it'll develop into like an autoimmune joint pain, right? And so Yarrow is one that I rely on really heavily for that. Yeah, is Mary. Is there a time to pick it that's better? Or what, what are know, the ideal harvesting moments? Um, I think it's personal preference, because I like the flower. Yeah. And how it th has that fragrance to it. But um, the, the small, younger leaves will work just as well as the plant as well. Yeah, it's kind of neat because sometimes in the spring, all you get is the big um, clumps of leaves first. So often I'll pick some then. And then in July, it's in like its glory, right? It's in full flower. And then we often collect them off then. And that's when the essential oils are the strongest. Yeah. You mentioned psoriasis. Can you make a salve out of it to apply it to psoriasis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of our more effective remedies for treating eczemas and um, psoriasis is we use yarrow. Yarrow has in itself, um, and we'll do like a skin series if you want down the road, right? Because that's a big um, topic that we all focus a lot on as a group. Um, Yarrow has a really, has actually steroidal constituents in it. So they're not like hydrocortisone, 
but you could almost say it's similar. That's why it takes down inflammation, relieves pain, and um, allows new cells to develop and grow. And so that's one of its actual beauties is how well it works on skin conditions. And pulling out the infection. Yeah. <coughs> the boil or something on your skin it helps to draw, drop it out as well. Yeah. So yarrow is a pretty um, complex plant. It covers a lot of bases, and that's barely scratching the surface, what we told you. <coughs> so we'll, we'll revisit it again in like future classes, and then, but at least it just gets you started researching it too, if that's what you're gonna do. And remember that it can really be applied to a lot of different conditions, different ways to keep us well. I thought we should do fireweed because we're going to make a remedy this afternoon from fireweed. Morris and I go out quite a bit searching for fireweed, although we don't have to search that high, hard. We just go out and pick a lot of it. In my backyard, actually. <laughs> we have like half an acre. Okay, we don't go that far. <laughs> and Morris's yard, too. We're neighbors. <laughs> so we basically have like an acre of it, <laughs> right? So what's the Niska name again? Pass. Is that right? Saying it right? Yes. Pass, right? <laughs> 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 <It's teasing us. laughs> so firewood's a pretty cool plant. You guys all recognize it, eh? We're going to pass them around. So we have the dry leaves and flowers. <coughs> whatever you like. We have a strainer. So fireweed or half, we harvest the um, whole plant, right? So we're, at, we're looking at leaves and flowers and stalks. I often don't pull it out of the ground. I often snip it, mm -hmm. right? Because I like the, the rest of the plant. I like it to return to the earth and become mulch and give back to where it was. So I rarely rip things out of the ground. It's, it's not technical. It's not really my practice often <coughs> um, for leaves and flowers for plants. Um, the best time to pick it, you get a couple opportunities, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. The one that we're passing around, we pick when it's in full swing in summer. So it's in bloom, right? July, June, July. And then uh, I bundle it and I dry it, I hang it up or we put it out on screens and we turn it every day, right? Either that or you can pick it when it's little, when it's uh, just coming up as a new shoot and it's only like a couple inches tall to maybe six inches. And you can eat it, it's really good. It's first food, right? Mm -hmm. So it tastes better than any vegetable I've ever had. And I can just, I just pick them as I'm walking through the forest and we eat them. Leaves, stalk. The inside is sweet because it's full of kind of uh, like a complex sugar part of the plant. And it's soft, it's white. If you cut it open, it's the pith is this white stuff that's really delicious to eat. It's all edible. Mm -hmm. The whole plant's edible when they're little. As they get older, they get tough. Right, so then it's like too tough for us to eat. Too uh, starchy, and yeah, too hard for us to break down chewing on bark. <laughs> <laughs> so little up to eight inches. Six yeah, inches. you'll know because yes. you won't want to eat it. To <laughs> <laughs> It'll start to get tough. It'll start to get tough. Uh, so it's nice when they're when little. They're really soft. You can break them up. Yeah, yeah, you can almost. It's <coughs> like um, trying to. Uh, create it to a vegetable, but I can't think of one. 
because they're more tender than a celery, but they're, you can just snap them and eat them. Right yeah, asparagus. Mm -hmm. ah. So they're full of vitamin C. Mm -hmm. They're full of flavonoids. Remember we talked about them? They're the flavonoids. They're full of beta carotene, which we need for our eyes, right? And they're full of mucilage. And when I say the word mucilage, all I mean is like a complex uh, substance that's all about softening and smoothing tissue inside your body. So this is why this is the power of this plant is that it wants to take down inflammation and smooth things, things that are red and inflamed and painful. So we use fireweed has a lot of properties, but the way that we're going to talk about it today is kind of specific to the lungs. So fireweed wants to kind of uh, tighten and tone the lungs. <coughs> it wants to open the airways wants to decrease inflammation. This is a very old remedy for back in the day for whooping cough, for pertussis. And I know we have outbreaks all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Of late? Mm -hmm. So um, this is the old treatment, one of the first plants used for it. There's, there's a few actually in our forest. It's an antispasmodic, so it's going to stop that kind of tight, restrictive cough mm -hmm. that doesn't, that, that just gets worse and worse and worse, right? You can use it for asthma. You can use, you can make this, you can make the leap for lung, lungs, okay? So anything kind of lung related. It's softening, it's taking down inflammation, it's smoothing the lungs, you're going to cough more effectively. It's also really good for the gut. Right? And when we're sick, sometimes we have stomach flus or stomach infections, and we lose a lot of fluid, we get diarrhea, right? We get a lot of pain, we got a lot of spasming, a lot of bloating. So the tannins and the astringent action of fireweed um, can reduce all of those symptoms and help you just recover from a gastro or from a flu quicker, a stomach bug. There's a really important role with fireweed. It has um, something that your stomach loves, and the little um, bacteria in our stomach love it, and they want to eat it, which they do, and then they multiple, multiply and divide. So it really stim stimulates the bacteria growth in our stomach. And when we do that, when our gut is healthy, it improves our immune system, and we're more likely to resist colds, influenza, or develop chronic disease. If we don't treat inflammation, everything stops there, unfortunately, with plants and with pharmaceuticals. This is an old thing I was taught. It's an old way of like working with plants is that you always go after inflammation first. And um, even if you can't maybe see it or you're just suspicious of it, you always just treat it. And typically, um, treat gut inflammation first. And then you're going to see people or yourself respond better to maybe your medication and plants. So there's really, really big leaps happening now. I shouldn't maybe say big leaps, but slowly the medical world is recognizing the role of our gut to our immunity, right? We're seeing more clinical research come out and we're seeing more attention placed on this thing they call the gut biome, our stomach, and so how it can rule our mental health and it can rule our immune system. So that's why I'm bringing up virus today. So even if we don't know exactly what's wrong with ourselves or with someone we care about, um, look after their stomach first. Mm -hmm. So, what else have we been using fireweed for? Mm -hmm. Did you say you make this into a tea, pretty much? Yeah, yeah. Like I guess we never told you how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. So one teaspoon of the dried plant in one cup of boiled water, the same as the yarrow. Um, we've also I've made a cold infusion. Did you? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, we made a cold infusion, which is a couple tablespoons of the dried plant in one quart of cold water, and then you let it sit for about 12 hours. 
So that really um, is a good revenue for STEMIC. When you use the plant because it's such a big plant, is it the whole plant or just leaves and flowers? Or It can be the whole plant except the root. Okay. I just snip right. them and I leave the root in the ground and we, we chop up the stalk and everything. Okay, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So cold infusions are a special type of tea, right? Your cold water and hot water will take out constituents and plants very differently. So we use a cold infusion to always treat the stomach because you get all the mucilage out of the plant and you get a number of other constituents that feed our healthy bacteria. And then for lungs, often I'll use the warm infusion, so the warm tea. Okay, so that's why we're going to teach, we teach kind of two different types. So again with the stomach, because I know you had a question about leaky gut, well, fireweed is definitely your plant. <coughs> to clean up and support the stomach. The lungs. Megan, is there yeah. a difference between using the dried leaves or, or anything dried of the plant versus the fresh one, like when you cut it off at the beginning? Yeah. When you make a cold infusion from the flesh, fre fresh plant, it's stronger. <laughs> uh, but you know what? Obviously, we don't have any fresh plants right now, so we're doing all dried plant cold infusions, and they're very effective. It works just as well. Yeah. It's just neat. You'll see in the spring when we go wildcrafting and you get a chance to make a cold infusion from a fresh plant, it's thicker, it's sweeter, it almost looks like a syrup after 12 hours. So that's my preference, right? And I know we like freeze a smoother, it. Yeah. A smoother taste to it. It's way so, smoother. Uh, in the summer when I picked a large plant, I chopped it all up and I put it in a great big um, container, like because I had so much and you need to use it within a few days, so I made them into ice cubes. So when, um, you know, I have an upset tummy, I would just grab them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What did you mix it with? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Or just honey? I don't no, know. You you don't don't add, we don't add honey no. to this one. You just shove the plants in an ice yep. cube? In, in the, uh, <laughs> oh, so oh, no, it's liquid. Water. Water. Okay. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. yeah. So Renee froze her cold infusion. She made ice cubes and they're really yummy. Awesome. Yeah. I was, yeah, I please do. Love, I fell in love with fireweed when I learned that in mm -hmm. July. Mm -hmm. And I've been pretty much having it almost daily. Yeah. But it really helped with um, removing inflammation in my in my knee in particular. Yeah. But it also is a great thing for toning the skin. So I've found a really big improvement in mm -hmm. my face and sagging, uh, saggy skin and stuff. And I actually it's drying, a, a little bit drying. Yeah. So one time I had a weepy wound and I actually just put a bandage of it on there and it kind of dried it up and mm -hmm. counteracted Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, it's like... I know it's a super it's plant. It's a super plant. And you I mean, mean internally though, like with your skin, it yeah. wasn't topically as well. That's right. right. No, yeah. internally, yeah. Mm -hmm. I found that my skin got more collagen or yeah. Yeah. like more rubbery, like yeah. a bit, like uh, mm -hmm. sagging. Yeah. And my under eye bags disappeared, mm -hmm. like not completely, but yeah. yeah. But it really wow. is a tonic, I think a toner, and and really cleans up inflammation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I have some frozen and dried. Nice. So mm -hmm. freezing the plant and sort of get that green back in the winter. So yeah. I saved that special. It's my special reserve. <laughs> That's a good idea. Mm. Is yours in water? Uh, al always cold in fusion. Always, okay. yeah. Cold and just let it in the fridge. Yeah. But did you freeze it in water or just freeze it? No, I just fr froze the green plants in, okay. in baggies. In yeah. So, okay. yeah. Um, I was just going to say that I, I've used, when I first met Megan, um, I started using uh, cleaver and fireweed and yarrow quite regularly. And at that time, I was using um, two stomach, like heartburn medication for your stomach. Mm -hmm. um, so I was on it once a, in the morning and once at night, and I started using the fireweed. And um, um, I, I was able to um, lower my dose on, down to just one stomach a day rather than two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Can you repeat the dosage for the cold infusion? <coughs> Is it teaspoons or tablespoons? Two tablespoons. Two tablespoons. heaping tablespoons in one quart of cold water. Okay. Thank and you. it is a super safe tonic. So you could, like Mary was saying, just can be on it for the rest of your life if you want. And it has that astringent action where it wants to, and that anti-inflammatory action. So it's not taking this formation down from everywhere, right? And then... Just a quick question regarding, when you say tablespoons, do you like grind that up into a fine powder or is it more like just broken up naturally like the, as the leaves crumble? Like does it particularly matter what kind of, uh, you know, how I deal with it before I put it in the mm -hmm. tablespoons? Mm -hmm. No. Not really. We tend to blend our, our plants so that they are easy to measure. So we'll, we'll run everything through a blender so that it's fine and then we do measure out like specific tablespoons. but. Um, you know, lots of times you can just break up plants naturally too with your hands and with your scissors, but so either way is going to, you're going to get some good, but this is, we are talking about these kinds of plants being blended and then measured because that's easier we found for people to kind of understand and then to get started. They're like, because it be, can be kind of like intimidating to know like, well, how much of the plant and do I use and what part exactly, right? So we tried to make it really simple blend up a lot of our remedies or our bulk plants. Yeah. And with none of the plants, it really matters if you eat them on an empty stomach or before or after food or before or after a cup of coffee or anything like that. They, yeah. they ignore all of that? Or? Well, it is, timing is uh, part of working with plants. Mm -hmm. So there is a few that are very specific mm -hmm. and almost when I'm kind of actively treating somebody with the faraway cold infusion, I do ask them to do it in a different way. I do ask them to take their one ounce or their quarter cup in the morning when they first get up before they put anything in their body. I want their stomach and their lungs to have the first shot at it, right? And I also don't want it to compete with anything, maybe with a... So, and we do that with a few other of our plants. But at the same time, if if that's beyond somebody's schedule, then I don't make these restrictions hard and fast. I say, just take it when you can, right? Because I'm more excited about you just taking it than following my every rule I have. <laughs> <laughs> so, but with cold infusions, it's nice to get them in your gut before anything else. So even, let's say I'm actively treating somebody's indigestion after they eat or um, stomach stuff, then I'll have them have a half a cup before they eat every meal, right? And then have their meal. Just like just like sometimes the way pharmaceuticals are handed out, right? Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, the um, the cold infusion is two tablespoons to, to a cup or a quart? <coughs> and then you let it sit overnight, like Renee said, on your counter. Then the next day you put it in the fridge and you change your batch every three days. That's the rule with tea. So it'll last for three days, but then after that, the plants want to start to break down, and we need to change it, okay? Mm. Um, some of our um, elders that we shared with me, uh, they like to mix the, the inside of the fireweed with uh, this, like so berries. Or Mix it in with the dessert. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty yummy. Sweet. Can you review one more time <coughs> the regimen, the three days I missed part of that? Did you say strain it after the oh, yeah. 12 hours in the leaves? Then you strain it out, and yeah. what's left you have in the fridge for three days. Yeah, and then you change your tea batch. So then if you haven't drink, drank it all, then you return it to the earth <coughs> and you make your new um, cold infusion that'll last for three days. Okay. Yeah. So do you put the quart jar in the fridge with uh, the um, fireweed in it or do you strain it before you put it in the fridge? It's really your comfort level. Yeah. Like sometimes I'll just leave all the plants in there and yeah. sometimes yeah. I strain it off. <coughs> I just leave it in there. Yeah, so it's really <coughs> what you guys want to do. There'll be no harm, okay. no harm will come from it. Yeah. 
So it wants to, um, fireweed really wants to help your lungs out and your stomach, right? So then there's that big connection. So if our, if our stomach is functioning and we have less yeast, we have, uh, <coughs> you know, good digestion, we have regular bowel movements and our immune system goes up, and we're more likely to resist lung infections or pneumonias or influenzas. So that's a, that's a bit, that's kind of a, in a nutshell some connections with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I have a sort of strange question. Maybe sure. um, our fire beat actually grows right next to the road. Oh yeah. And um, I was wondering, should it actually be cleaned off before you do anything with the plants? because there's a lot of traffic and it's a dirt road. And yeah. And I was just thinking, hmm. <laughs> yeah, we problems. usually tend, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. I was just gonna say <laughs> We usually tend to pick medicine where no one has gone. Um, there's not a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. There's no people walking or dogs or. Yeah. So you find a place where off the trail, um, if you're worried about it, you could wash it, but usually, yeah. Um, you know, I find just off the trail is the best. Because okay. it's hard to clean a plant, yeah. right? So it can be hard to run a lot of water over it. It can damage the flowers. You can, it's hard to scrub dirt off sometimes of plants. So then we just have to leave those ones often if they're really covered. Right? Leaves and flowers are pretty fragile. So often I don't want to add more water to them either because then they take too long to dry mm -hmm. and more likely right. to break down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Morris had a good, he just whispered to me, <laughs> 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 tell them where we pick it. <laughs> the burn areas, where oh. they can cut some forest areas. First thing you burn there is the fire mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good place to search and <coughs> Yeah, it's a, um, I just forgot the word for it, we're almost out of time, but it's called a, <coughs> there's a special word, but it'll have a cycle, because it's like, it's bringing value to that piece of land, right? So succession. Yeah, succession, and I think it's about six years, thank you. And um, and then once fireweed is done there, other things can come, right? Usually you'll see right, little trees start to begin, or other plants, anemones, and horsetails and stuff. So it has a beautiful gift that it gives us by coming first to those areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>